Welcome everyone, I'm Kathleen McGuigan, Editor of Architectural Record, and I'm here today speaking with Neri Oxman, one of the most provocative explorers of the future of architecture, who is experimenting in revolutionary ways with the intersection of design and na nature. Through her interdisciplinary research platform at MIT's Media Lab, Oxman brings together teams working in biology, computation, engineering, product design, and architecture. So to begin today, uh, Neri, we find ourselves in this extraordinary moment where an element of nature, the coronavirus, is devastating our world. It's nature exerting a force that we rarely acknowledge in our day-to-day -day lives. But your work is based on a profound reinterpretation of our relationship as humans to nature. So if you could just begin by telling us a little bit about your philosophy and how it has led to your approach to design. Neri? Material ecology uh, started as a research approach to the work that we've been doing at the lab and slowly have become to define a field in architectural design that considers nature as client or really nature uh, as the epicenter of the architectural endeavor. In that approach, the architect can no longer solely or merely think about the product itself and the user as, uh, or the human as the sole user of the product, but rather an entire ecological niche, an entire environment uh, that surrounds the product in the building as the client. Um, that means, of course, that the palette of materials and the palette of forces and conditions uh, that inform the built environment uh, is um, much wider in range. Uh, it also incorporates forces that are invisible, very much like the forces that are being expressed through the pandemics, very much like the forces that are being expressed by global warming and climate change. Those are forces that are uh, invisible to us, yet their impact becomes visible by the day. And so as architects, we now have to um, exercise or practice a much wider, broader, and deeper lens by which we view uh, this fusing between the built environment, the natural environment, and the biological environment. Material ecology is more akin to growing than building. Uh, when we enter architectural school, when we study uh, how to design a building or even a simple product, um, we're used to defining or designing that product in three dimensions, the X, Y, and Z of the physical space. Uh, nature obviously operates in a uh, matrix of dimensions that far exceeds these three dimensions of space, X, Y, and Z. These dimensions can include uh, forces such as load and temperature, heat flux, variations in humidity, uh, viral forces. Uh, microbial forces. Um, those are forces that usually do not enter the design process and even the computational tools as we know them. In architectural design today, there is a dimensional mismatch between the products and the buildings that we're designing and between the forces that are actually informing or shaping uh, those buildings in the natural environment. Tell us a little bit about your early experiments with objects in nature. So what's so unique about uh, objects that are grown objects, artifacts that have been grown by the natural world and biological artifacts, um, is that they are multifunctional. Um, and they're made of material systems that vary their properties continuously and gradually as a function of the type of performance, structural, environmental, uh, that they perform. In the built environment, uh, unlike the natural environment, we tend to separate between materials and their performance. We use concrete and steel for structural performance. We use glass for visual connectivity. We use rubber or fabric for comfort. So we choose our materials based on the types of functions that these materials um, must embody by through the design brief. In the natural world, however, you find material systems that vary their properties gradually from stiff to soft, from opaque to transparent, uh, from, um, um, from strong, very strong materials to, again, uh, rubber-like materials. 
within a single, within their volume element or within their surface, uh, surface element? What kind of tools might we be able to invent to fabricate materials that vary their properties gradually and allow us to create multifunctional objects, uh, building skins that act both as barriers that are structurally sound and as filters that can filter air, that can filter uh, heat, uh, control temperature, regulate, uh, be thermally regulating, etc. And so this is the goal. Um, how to create these multifunctional material systems and what technologies must we invent that enable us to generate these multifunctional systems. One example is aguahoja. The two most abundant black polymers are cellulose, which makes up half of the plant kingdom uh, on our planet. The second most abundant biopolymer on our planet is chitin, which comes from crustaceans amongst other sources of natural matter. And there are other biopolymers that were included in this project, such as pectin, which you can find in apple skins or lemon skins, calcium carbonate, uh, etc. What's wonderful about the natural world is that it uses a very um, uh, small array of molecular uh, elements and creates the most incredible range of properties um, from them. And this is what we did with the platform. The robotic arm basically mixes between those biopolymers, cellulose, chitin, pectin, and calcium carbonate to generate a wide range of um, material properties that vary in their mechanical properties, again, from stiff to soft, and their optical properties from opaque materials to translucent, almost transparent materials. With Aguahoja, uh, we're not fully transparent yet, but we're getting close. The beauty of the platform is it allows you to do what we call parametric chemistry. It allows you to use the power of chemical interactions um, in a molecular scale using a robotic arm uh, that creates large scale components, architectural sized components, and control mechanical and optical properties uh, within those components. So with Aguahoja, we design a five meter tall architectural pavilion that's made entirely of these natural biopolymers. And so everything is designed. Where do we want the pavilion to be structurally sound? Where do we want the pavilion to be soft? How do we want the pavilion to decay upon contact with the rain? How do, do we want the pavilion to take wind load? How do we want the pavilion to distribute light? Do we want to incorporate microorganisms in the printing platform that would allow us to generate a photosynthetic response in the pavilion's facade? So we start with nature-inspired design and we end with design-inspired nature, a place where we are actually designing that nature. So, so we start with computational processes and algorithms that are informed and inspired by the natural world. We move from nature inspired to nature informed to using actually natural materials, materials we find in the natural environment, to in the end, um, designing nature herself, using uh, actually synthetically engineering DNA in order to create new types of biological materials where the differentiation between man-made and nature-grown is obliterated.